Hi, everybody. Welcome to week 22 of the ENM 2020 course. Um, we have Rob Anderson, Jamie Cass, Mona Papej, and Marlon Kobos, as well as me here. Um, so you've got a larger than normal group of instructors, and we're going to jump right into questions. Um, this week's uh, content was centered on starting into talking about model evaluation. So Rob gave a, uh, an overview and then I gave a bit more detail, essentially focused on how do you use predictive ability to evaluate how good or bad a model is or how significant or non-significant a model is. So I'm gonna share my screen and take us to the, uh, the questions. Let's see. Oh, by the way, this was interesting. For a different reason, I needed to find out who was taking this course. And so I did a quick poll of the Facebook group. And I was really surprised. It was not how I would have guessed, but uh, 111 people responded from South America, 65 from North America, 51 from Europe, 41 from Asia, 35 from Africa, uh, four from Australia. So that's an interesting distribution. Congratulations, South America. Mm -hmm. But let's go, here we go. Okay, anybody have a question that is really, really urgent to be answered? Nobody speaks up soon. I had a couple picked out. Here's one that I think is good for discussion. I agree in using independent data to evaluate the model whenever possible. And certainly always if we are talking about validation. However, if my model is based on an algorithm based on the statistical test of hypothesis testing, such as logistic regression, is it strictly necessary to use independent data for its evaluation? That is, in each step, the variable entered in the model, among, among other criteria, uh, were those variables that passed the hypothesis test. So, you know, th this is interesting, um, and it kind of takes us to a, a tension between um, statistical testing and, and model selection. And yeah, it's true, as you did your calibration process, there is frequently some testing in there. And there's also frequently uh, some sort of process of simplification or regularization, which may remove variables that, um, that didn't have a, a, an appropriate contribution. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but um, the idea that a model is the best that you could fit or was the selected model or that passed a set of criteria doesn't necessarily indicate to us that it is a model that does better than flipping a coin and doesn't necessarily indicate to us if the model is good enough for what we were wanting to use it for. So I, I think testing with independent evaluation is, is absolutely crucial, independent evaluation data. Um, what does everybody else think? Right, um, I agree. And the other thing is that unless you have some uh, independent test, then I don't think you have an opportunity to assess, um, well, let me back up. If you, I mean, presumably those tests are assuming um, various things about the data used uh, to, to do the internal uh, selection. And one of those um, presumably is the lack of sampling bias. Um, so if you don't have an independent test, I don't see how you would have any ability to detect any overfitting to that bias. Um, so I think that's a reason uh, why we would need uh, 
uh, independent test, even in those situations. Definitely. Um, and I think more generally, it speaks to the idea of, you know, the these internal parameterizations, which are like selecting variables uh, from you know some quantitative uh, analytical um, approach rather than you know simply uh, the thinking uh, about them uh, approach, which is something I think we should do too. I think we should do that first. Um, but the internal fitting uh, and selection is you know often removing some variables. Um, and, and that is gets into some of the questions about dimensionality and so on. Um, but but that is different than um, you know how well does it do and is it better than random? Um, so I think I think we might want to get into uh, a little bit more on um, maybe the some of this about you know your individual models versus your final model. How do you report uh, statistics? That was a uh, twenty four sixty seven because a lot of these are obviously are related. Um, maybe we go ahead and yeah, it looks like town is going there. 2467. Yep. So we can apply model evaluation measures for each model generated. I would qualify that each candidate model generated. But if we decide on one final model or ensemble model, how's the best way of presenting the model evaluation? Yeah. So do you want me to follow with that? Go for it. Yeah. So, um, I mean, usually we're evaluating these candidate models by some uh, data splitting. And so you imagine like if you want to have a Maxent example, um, you are trying different, maybe you're just trying different feature classes or you could be trying different environmental data sets or whatever you're trying, you have different options. And um, say with the, you have, four different, like you have your occurrence records and you divide it into four groups and you have four iterations there. So you're, you determine that, you know, the best model was linear and quadratic feature classes. Wonderful. Um, and you have four estimates of performance um, based on that because you had four different withheld data sets. And you can, um, you can report your individual um, omission rates or AUC or whatever values of performance you're using, you can uh, report those individually or an average of those. Um, but you may even want to make a final model with all of your records um, with those same settings. Um, and so that is not going to have um, an independent evaluation per se, but you can report the earlier ones. Um, or if you find a couple settings that are basically co-optimal, um, you can uh, report the you know, the statistics of the individual ones. Um, but I think it's probably a, another question for, or a question for somebody else about how you would best report um, statistics on an, on an ensemble. I haven't thought about that very much. Yeah, I, I've gotten this question a lot before. Um, which do I do? Uh, do I use all my data and use the model settings that I selected? Or do I do some kind of average of all the uh, can, uh, the partitioned models. And I guess in machine learning, there are two schools of thought, like how, how to proceed. In my mind, all the partitioned models are using a subset of your data, every single one by definition. None of them have all the data. Um, you're doing model selection in order to choose model settings, not to choose a model per se. So you choose your model settings and you'd want to use as much data as possible, which is all of it. So I, I, I don't really, I guess I don't get the other, the other um, philosophy where you'd want to average the, the partition models. Um, but um, I guess some people do it and they must have a reason for it. But I, I'd want to use as much data as possible. I think the, the argument is that the optimal set of settings may be different yeah. when you're using, you know, all 150 points mm -hmm. as opposed to the 75 that were in your subsample. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. I think, I think you, if you make the difference between calibrating a model, which is essentially choosing a whole set of, of detailed values for different parameters, if you make a difference between calibrating mm -hmm. 
and, and then evaluating that model, then that whole calibration process becomes um, essentially just establishing those parameter values. And you can think of your different replicates of, of points as essentially characterizing that broader set of points, the full set, as opposed to a particular subset. Right, with ecological data, I mean, you, the, the, the particular data set you have in hand is usually not all the data that you could possibly gather, right? It's one realization of the data for that species. Right. And so this, the setting, if you're doing uh, cross-validation, the settings are, are chosen based on how well your model does on realizations of data in general. And so therefore, uh, you should expect that at some point you'll receive new data. <laughs> And you would, you would hope that the model settings you chose are good for that new realization of the data as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a more general answer to that, that type of question is you're setting aside the most independent data set that you have for evaluation. And that should be set aside and essentially held back from the entire process until you decide on your, your final model settings or your ensemble of models with different settings, whatever. And it should be a simple evaluation. Is this model statistically significantly better than random? And is this model performing well enough for the purposes of my study? But what you do with the data that you're going to use to create that model may indeed include evaluation steps, mm -hmm. okay? But that is an internal evaluation. Uh, some people will use a validation, the term validation, but that is an internal process that is part of the model calibration, even if it includes a rock test or a, a kappa uh, or whatever the, the particular index may be. What happens while you are choosing that final model is all part of calibrating a model optimum. And then at the very end, you need to have a data set with which to evaluate your model formal. That's, yeah, that's a very broad kind of overarching answer. So, yeah, I think uh, probably a flow chart of that would help people. And I don't know if, um, I don't know if I've seen that in any papers. I think that could be useful for a course or a paper. Um, and a lot of times we don't, I mean, we meaning me and my collaborators, um, don't do the external, external one. Sometimes we have the, the Bull et al. paper that I featured is one example where we did that. I mean, that wasn't the, the advance of that paper, but, but we, we did that indeed. Um, and I think, I think that should be something aspirational. Maybe uh, e &M eval, uh, the third version, Jamie. <laughs> um, so. Oh no, the, the next version does that. Well, I get it would be a possibility. I guess you'd have to, yeah. I mean. Yeah, but it, it, there's a distinction to make between an independent data set, a really independent data set, right. and then the independent data used for cross validation. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it will allow you to evaluate performance and see if it's on something that you completely completely withheld but that mm -hmm. but this that's that pulling those out would have to be something that the user does themselves beforehand right yeah yeah um but yeah we're user specified is one of our favorite things now to allow people a lot of a lot of flexibility um yeah i think that's i think that's a good point of town that makes things harder of course um but yeah that sounds good well oh, i mean it's quite rare to have the luxury of multiple data sets ca collected with uh, multiple techniques or you know, multiple data sets that you would expect to differ in their underlying biases. I mean, some of those biases are universal. You know, there are environments that are quite simply rare. Mm -hmm. And there's really no way to sample those environments more frequently than they're represented on the earth or in a particular region. And, you know, there are questions of access that may be pretty much impossible to solve. 
but, is, you know, so, so it is rare to, to have that luxury, but so maybe the word aspirational is, is the correct one where ideally this is what you do. And under less than ideal circumstances, you do the very best you can to break up those biases yeah. and then, you know, use subsets of the available data. And in circumstances where you just don't have enough information, then maybe you just state, I don't produ produce or don't present a final model evaluation because I simply don't have that kind of information available to me. I just wrapped up a manuscript that's been sitting around on my desk for eight years, and we had a total of 20, 25, 30 points for some species, and we were working at too fine a resolution to say, well, let's set aside half of them. And so I opted to focus on the main question, which was something different, and not present a final model evaluation. But under under as many circumstances as possible, we should we should present an evaluation. Right. Um, this this leads to two things, and then hopefully, um, Town and I can share the screen a bit more, um, <laughs> and not talk as much. Um, but it one of the questions was specifically about well, how do I do some of these evaluations, especially spatial uh, and spatially independent evaluations, if I don't have many records? And with the jackknife, how can I do that? And so there are compromises that we have to make when we don't have as much data. For example, when, when we're below, I don't know, 20 records or so, I mean, I've generally simply done a jackknife which doesn't have any formal um, spatial uh, segregation. Um, and it would be even harder, you know, than to have something external to that. So I think we're even more aspirational with load, uh, load sample sizes. Um, but the other thing it goes to is, I think in 2500, there's a lot of confusion. And I think, I think it'd probably be good for several to talk about performance versus significance, um, to bring home the point uh, the town made in his uh, presentation. 2500. Yeah. It's correct to say that AUC, ROC, omission rate, commission rate, are to evaluate the significance of the model and metrics derived from the confusion matrix are to evaluate the performance of the model. Yeah, there, there's a lot of confusion in there because omission rate, commission rate, AUC and ROC, in some senses are all derived from the confusion matrix. The only thing is that AUC, ROC, which are really the same thing, are derived from multiple confusion matrices for each different threshold. So, I mean, I would offer some, some like friendly rewording of uh, what Town put in his presentation. So Town, tell me if, uh, if I'm understanding what you were saying or you were making a different point and then I really want to hear from the other people too, uh, in addition to Town. Um, like the, the, me the assessment of significance is via a test that uses some measure of performance. Um, like an emission rate or an AUC um, or any of these things that we can quantify. Um, and there are ways um, to, to assess, you know, significance of that. Tom mentioned the binomial tests. I mentioned these uh, randomization tests uh, in, uh, that were proposed in the paper by Quentin Bull and Kate Jamie was a co-author there. Um, and those are to get at effect size and, um, you know, a, a P level, right? Um, and what, I think town is saying is then look at the absolute uh, level of performance that you get for the individual statistics and say, is that good enough for my biological use? Right? Yeah. Um, I mean, think about, think about, think back to your introductory statistics course. When you do a statistical test, using traditional frequentist approaches, what you do is you specify an alpha level, which is essentially the, the probability that you use as a criterion for deciding this is unusual enough an event that I'm going to consider it not 
in accord with my, with my null hypothesis. Usually by convention, we use 0 0.05 for alpha. And then a statistical test is simply, is my observation at a lower probability value, the p-value, than that alpha? And it is not a question of how much lower. It's just, do I reject the null hypothesis or not? And so omission rate, commission rate, all that sort of stuff, those are indices of predictive performance. AUC has been used two ways. AUC can be used, I think, inappropriately as a performance measure, or it can be compared with a null distribution that's usually developed by, by subsampling uh, from the occurrence data, but you can essentially use AUC as a significance test. But again, my point is the significance test is, has a result that is either yes or no. And so you'll see this discussion where, you know, you'll say, as usually reviewers will point out, it's not a matter of, you know, P less than 0 0.000001 is more significant than p less than 0.05. The question is, what was your alpha value and was the observed probability below that alpha value? And that is simply yes or no. So here, here's my favorite anecdote and then I will shut up. Um, this is not a vulgar gesture, but on my finger here, there is a scar. And the scar is from a vampire bite that I got in 1989, taking a, um, a bat out of a net in Western Mexico. And my sister does public health work. I knew I'd been bit, bitten by a possible rabies carrier. I call her up and I say, what do I do? And she said, get it tested. I had the bat on ice. I go to a lab in Guadalajara. And they said, oh yeah, we do the negra bodies test. And I got the results back, bat tested negative. And I called my sister and I said, I'm good, I'm going back into the field. And my sister said, no, you're coming back to the United States and you're gonna get the full, uh, the full treatment to make sure you don't develop rabies symptoms. And I said, why? I got a test back that was negative. Now, there's the, the lesson. Negerbody's test is far better than random at establishing whether a particular animal has rabies or not. It's, it's under a particular staining regime. It's are there little black bodies in the brain tissue. And it's way, way, way better than, uh, than random. So if it was between that and flipping a coin, use the negger bodies test. But what my sister pointed out to me was that the correct classification rate was 56%. So here's a test that was 56% correct, way, 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 way better than random. So you reject the null hypothesis. It predicts better than random. But my sister was saying, I'm not going to risk you developing rabies. You come back to the United States. I said, I want to do my field work. And she said, if you don't call me from the United States within 48 hours, I'm telling mom and dad. So I ended up going back to the US. My point is, there's a big difference between statistical significance and performance that's sufficiently good for whatever your purpose is. Why are you making this model? That to me is the, the best example, but it's, it's one that's close to my heart. Yeah, Marlon, I guess. Marlon Mona, Jamie. Yeah.
I guess everybody like had a course in statistics and I guess all teachers always say the same thing, like statistical significance doesn't mean the model or the test is very good or your results are very good or are significant biologically, no. They only, they only mean they are better than random or not uh, in, like in general terms. And I guess <clears throat> that's also true. Like imagine like even the alpha that we decide is just based on the hand, how many fingers you have in your hand. So that's not, that's not necessarily saying your model is good for representing your question or your interest biologically. Uh, and so you have to do other tests. I was gonna say that the, the, the difference between significance and performance, like you said now, has to do with when you have significant, when you are calculating or you're after significance, you have to have null models. Um, and performance is, I have a model, I have extra data, I'm gonna, you know, calculate omission or uh, error. How how well does my model perform in terms of omission error, or is my model able to accurately predict presence is present? So that it's that's performance has nothing to do with significance. And I was gonna say that related to your your uh, close encounter with rabies, um, we could run. We could have um, we could run random models. We have a, we have our model, and then we create a null distribution. But then we set the uh, omission error, you know, our our uh, threshold at I don't know 0.4, and then our actual model is better than random, but it's at 0.4 omission error, which is not a performant model. So yeah, we can. Uh, we can really have significance, but uh, like Marlon said, the what we set as our um, I don't know measuring stick is bad. <laughs> the, the cartoon example is if I have a sample size of one point for testing, I may have a result of zero percent omission, which is really good performance, but it's not going to be statistically significant. I'm not going to reject my null hypothesis of, of random association between prediction and, and data. And that, and that happens when you have uh, an area, a study area that is like really limited and your points are over dispersed in, in that area, which happens sometimes, like in some islands, some species are just everywhere. And if you you want to create a model of that, you can have like better like models that predict your points very good, like because the prediction is the entire island. Does, does that mean that's a good model? Uh, I don't think so. Like uh, sometimes those kind of models result in like partial rocks that are like worse than random or above zero point zero five, for example because like you don't have any evidence outside those environments you cannot limit the what is suitable and what is unsuitable for the species in those kind of cases mm -hmm. so it's it's also sometimes a, a matter of asking yourself is it worth to create that model with the with the presence absence model we're usually talking about presence background models or uh but with the presence absence model if you use auc then if it's above 0.5, you're doing better than random. And then it, everything above 0.5 is how much better than random you're doing. But because we don't have absence data, uh, you can't use the metric as an absolute evaluation of performance. What you can do, however, is, is use it as a relative measure of performance when comparing models that are built on the same data with different settings. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, I agree that you know AUC is a little bit, um, uh, what's it called? With the presence background uh, models, it you know, a lot of people report the number and say my model did did this well. You know, it's it's between uh, 0.7 and 0.8, so therefore it's a good model. It could have been excellent if it was 0.9. Um, <laughs> that that would have been true more or less if it's presence absence data, but presence background, uh, you know, not necessarily so. Exactly. <laughs> 
I think that's a case where we can assess significance via randomization approaches and, and comparison with the null model, but I don't think we can really set a, a level of AUC that we say is acceptable um, because when we don't have um, absence data, then it's you know, it, it's not an absolute measure of, of anything that we can interpret. Um, so I think admission rate, you could set that, but I don't know, Town, how you would say um, with an AUC calculated with presence background and presence through absence data, I don't think, how, I don't know how you could say, you know, I want a model that is at least this good. Well, I don't, I don't think AUC is a very good performance measure. I mean, we may have something like, I want a correct classification rate better than 0.9 or I want an omission rate below 0.1, or a commission rate that's harder because it depends on absence data. Um, but you know those are more reasonable performance metrics. AUC does reflect performance. And as Jamie said, when you have presence absence data, it has a very clear interpretation, but with presence background data, it, the interpretation is pretty cloudy. But yeah, it's no longer, there's, there's no, no meaning to the absolute number you get out of it. Or even relative, absence data. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and yeah, with pseudo absence or background data, when you're calculating that, they, there's no absolute meaning to those actual numbers. They're only useful within that study region for that study species with those variables, so. I just want to point out, I've, I've, I've done analyses where I've gotten model predictions where everything is suitable, like the entire extent is suitable due to the model settings. It has an emission rate of zero. It didn't emit anything, but everything is good. So it's, it's not ecologically realistic at all. And so it, it taught me to look at different metrics and to really examine predictions. It's hard when you're automating these things over thousands of species and you need to develop some kind of routine. And sometimes you might uh, miss things like that, but it's very, very important to take a look at the, the prediction and put on your ecologist hat and say, does this make sense? Uh, because you can't just trust the numbers of the metrics anyway. Um, my final comment on significance is that in this project led by Quentin Bull, um, I mean, it was rather sobering when he pointed out things from the literature about some of the assumptions that we had made that go all the way back to my dissertation and um, town don't please don't take away my PhD but one of the one of the chapters he, he cites in this paper that Jamie and I are co-authors um, I need to go down a little bit farther I think to find the right part um, but we we assume actually let me go to the very beginning um, and then I'll read the discussion I have one little part of it um, want to share your screen Rob um, Okay, let's work on that. Okay, is that, is it sharing right now? It is about to, I believe. To. Working on it? Yes. Okay. All right, I was, okay. Um, so I'm gonna read some of the blue part. Um, Unfortunately, some of the most common measures of performance for niche models have underlying assumptions that are unreasonable in many situations. Uh, for example, violation of a test assumptions can be saw, caused by sampling bias, spatial autocorrelation of the distribution of the species and or the environmental variables, and unequal pr proportions of the various environmental conditions available. So for quite a while, we've understood um, issues regarding sampling bias and how that can, violation of that assumption um, can make our tests unre unreasonable. Um, but I, I didn't until working with this student who was in somebody else's lab, I didn't understand um, the part about how the spatial autocorrelation of the environmental variables um, can affect things, or even simply the unequal proportions of the various environmental conditions available. And so that's why the, um, and this paper makes a very simple, but I think a really important modification to some uh, approaches uh, that were uh, performed by Beal and um, uh, Grayson Trustige. But at the end, and we compared with the binomial one, 
And I think it's very important for using uh, like the, the binomial example that we developed in my first collaborations with town, I think is really important for understanding the point of what we're trying to do. Um, but he made me understand that often um, one or more of those assumptions are not, um, are not met. And it seems to primarily be issues with the, um, the spatial autocorrelation of the environmental uh, conditions present. And I think I'm almost to the part of the, yeah, so here we go. <laughs> so <laughs> Jamie and Quentin convinced me. Uh, fourth, some of the methods available now for producing null distributions and significance estimates seem to be inappropriate. Researchers should be particularly cautious of, with the binomial test Anderson et al. 2002 for emission rate. Here it yielded very different results than our no model approach. Um, despite that the fact that test, most models resulted in very poor ORs, in this case, the majority of these were highly significant according to the binomial test. This test rests on the assumption that the pixels of the study region are independent observations, which is probably strongly violated in many situations because of the spatial structure of the, in the variation of environmental conditions across the study region. It is thus prone to very high rates of type one error. Um, and then it goes on um, to consider some uh, important uh, contributions that have been made. And it says other methods based on bootstrap replications of the species occurrence data may be equally susceptible to this problem because they account for variation associated with the sampling of the current data, but not for sources of error associated with environmental structure across the study region. Um, so I, this is something that was completely new for me. I'm gonna stop the share now. Um, and I, I think, um, that we're, we're con constantly moving forward in the field and realizing assumptions that we didn't realize before. Um, and as people are realizing that, you know, generally what's happening in the field is finding new ways to, you know, to integrate data um, to actually, instead of make the assumption, um, use information to characterize whatever that issue is. Um, so I think that's the direction that we're going. Um, and so be, beware, especially of reading older papers and just following um, the methods um, because um, we're, we're learning. We're still, we're still learning a lot. Uh, actually, if you can pass me a copy of that paper, I'll put it on the course site so that people will have access to it. Okay. I, I think it was in the Dropbox that I sent you of, uh, of the maybe six or eight papers that I suggested. Okay. Shoot. I'll, I'll find it. Okay, yeah, there were like four core ones that were maybe the ones that I featured, which that should be, and then there were a few um, that I thought were important ancillary reading. Okay, yeah, as far as the environmental structure as a, at least inflating sample sizes, if not also introducing biases, um, I had to deal with that years ago in a paper on soil helminths in, in East Africa. And you know the long and the short of it is I started with, I think it was 1,200 points, and I ended up with 40 because I was measuring very carefully the autocorrelation structure of the environments. And to get, um, to get points that were sufficiently separated in space as to be essentially independent in terms of the environments that they presented, I, I, I don't remember what the distance was, but imposed a distance on the points. And that brought me from, you know, basically two orders of magnitude of data loss. And then splitting that into calibration versus evaluation data, I ended up with, you know, 15, 20 points, something like that. There are questions that people want to answer? Yeah, can we can we go to question uh, two four nine one? Two four nine one. The number two part of it is something I think is important to discuss briefly. It's important that it be brief, or it's important that we discuss it at least briefly. Can uh, both. You, <laughs> can you explain <laughs> what is the AIC for model evaluation? According to many papers and authors, this is also a good metric for model evaluation. Yeah, so 
I just want to point out that AIC is not based on cross-validation at all. And so in a lot of papers, I see people select a model based on AIC and they say, uh, you know, we used cross-validation to select the model. It's not cross-validation. It's simply taking, it's like summing all the uh, values of the, of the cells and then uh, uh, multiplying it by some scalar value and then subtracting the number of parameters in some way. Anyway, what it does is it penalizes the, the AIC is penalized by the number of parameters and it's uh, increased by the likelihood of the model. It's a very, very simple calculation, but has nothing to do with withheld data. Um, so it is called a model evaluation. Uh, I just looked it up and the Wikipedia entry says it's a kind of model evaluation. And it's also an estimator for um, cross-validation apparently. But in my experience, uh, it's with, with at least with uh, species distribution models, um, when you select a model via AIC, it's usually wildly different from the model you'd select uh, via cross-validation. Yes. So it's important to recognize that, that the, they are different. Uh, I'm not saying that AIC is, is wrong per se, but it, it definitely does not. Um, it doesn't force the model to make extrapolations or things like that. Whereas, uh, you know, spatial cross-validation, for example, does that. Yeah, it's, it's, not, that it's not explicitly challenging the model to predict. Right. And frequently, it's the predictive ability that we are wanting when we do these models. Some of the things I, I realized together with Luis and Jorge, other teachers of this course, is that usually AAC gets lower values when your uh, predicted suitabilities in occurrences are more similar among each other. And when you have like higher values of suitability in occurrences uh, as compared to the other points in the background. And uh, that's, that's the first part is kind of like neat in the sense that it's uh, trying to uh, avoid overfitting in models, uh, but also it's risky in the sense that like interpreting suitabilities uh, so of models selected based on this kind of metric, um, like it, you, probably you should avoid that and, and concentrate in the limits of suitability rather than exact values of suitability, whatever the, the, the transformation of the maximum values are. And, yeah. Mona, thank you for being here for support. Um, you, ha I mean, you have other lectures um, for this topic. Um, what would you like to, to highlight, either as principles or anything you pulled out of the questions? Um, I had a question. I, I, I was, I had selected a question and now I cannot, cannot find it. Um, oh, it was about, I don't, know where the line or which line had the question, but it was about um, using occurrence data from a different time period. Uh, so the question was, can I use occurrence data to evaluate a model if the occurrence data is from a, a you know, temporally different, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's temporally different compared, compared to the calibration data. And I thought that was an interesting question because um, it can be it, it can be actually a question of extrapol extrapolating the model. So if you have you have historical occurrence data from let's say 1960s to 1990s, and then you have your you went in the field in last year, and you want to test the model with the data you collected last year. It's interesting because uh, the range could have shifted due to changes in climate and environmental conditions. And now what you are doing, you're evaluating the model for extrapolation, not for uh, just predictive power in general. Uh, so I think my answer would be, be careful about how, you know, how, how, separated your training and testing data are temporally because you might be testing the model for something else than what you initially 
uh, envisioned. So, you know, if you build a model to estimate the potential distribution of a species, but then you test the model, you evaluate the model with data that are quite, you know, way too new, <laughs> you might be, like I said, uh, getting into extrapolating issues there. Yeah, if um, the environment has changed, yes. Now, yeah. the other problem or the other concern with that is whether the sampling is independent, which is to say, you know, if you're looking at trees or, or kind of established yeah. populations, it, it may not be independent. You may, you may or may not be going back to the same sites or even seeing the same individuals or the descendants of the same individuals. I think it's a really, it's really a question of, of if you really are into evaluation, it's a question of thinking really hard about what does independence mean? Mm -hmm. I think I think something that Mona pointed out uh, about the extrapolation risks it's in, it's really really important and uh, think about this kind of evaluation like in different time periods uh, I think that can be done better in environmental space rather than in geography if the conditions are different or you suspect that they can be different uh, it's something that we do with ellipsoids, for instance. And uh, I think that's, that would be a good way to test whether your model can predict those points or not. But uh, the attach to the geography has to be, that attach has to be undo because uh, you won't be able to test it that way. You can, you can do it that way. Uh, and also that, that kind of reminds me that when you were talking about independent evaluation before, uh, some of the things that you have to remember is that uh, probably that in that evaluation is better to be done in the same area of model calibration because that way you can assure that uh, the values of environments are like in the range of uh, the ones that you actually use for calibrating the models or you can do an extra test and decide whether the environments of the independent data, independent data, which are in a different area, uh, are present risk of extrapolation or not, that that's something that is important before testing whether in, uh, in the independent data can be can be predicted or not by your model. Yeah. So I wonder <clears throat> with this in this case with this question if i have data from 2019 and i build the model with historical data from the 60s to 90s um i wonder if doing what you said marlon um mapping in uh, environmental space or plotting your data in a niche a or in some some environmental um with some tool mapping your data in environmental space and then deciding okay my my validation data from 2019 are really different environmentally from my core historical data. I should probably not, not use those uh, to validate the model. But how about um, trying to predict an invasive species where let's say it's native to Europe and then invasive in US. Um, we, I seen, I mean, I, probably I have done it too. Yes, I've done it too. Uh, we test the, the prediction with, or the map potential distribution with the uh, data from invaded range. And so again, that's where we, that, I mean, not again, it's, a, it's in contrast. In this case, when we try to uh, uh, estimate the potential distribution on a, potential distribution of an invasive species, we actually want the model to be capable to extrapolate. So in that case, when I do the training in Europe, maybe what I want to do is split the data spatially quite, quite drastically in order to get a model that is capable to extrapolate in, you know, in my, uh, in my calibration uh, region in Europe and then have more confidence about the model extrapolation power for invasive species. But I know extrapolation is frowned upon people don't like statistical 
people <laughs> hate the not hate but are uncomfortable with the idea of extrapolating models. Yeah, the problem is is that uh, extrapolating does not depend only in how points are partitioned, but also in the background. Mm -hmm. So in yeah. Europe, for instance, you will always get extrapolations towards drier, warmer places because they don't have deserts there. Mm -hmm. uh, or if they have something that is close to that, it's not as drastic as mm -hmm. other deserts in the world. And then there are species that like those kind of environments, that live in those kind of environments. And if you project those models to areas that are drier and, wor and warmer, you're gonna, if your model still is increasing towards those conditions, in terms of response, you're gonna have extrapolation either way. And you don't know, like based on that, what currently is right now matching or other like models that can do extrapolation, uh, you're not gonna have like a point in which your response is gonna start decreasing. So mm -hmm. you have risk of extrapolations anyway. Uh, and the only way to test it is like apply a measure of extrapolation risks and decide whether the risks of extrapolating in those areas based on similarities to your calibration conditions are uh, like safe or not. So, so just to kind of put together a bunch of things that have been mentioned, Marlon said something about doing the testing in environmental space. And Mona's mentioned extrapolation. So if we put all that together, transferring a model, which is to say, mm -hmm. taking a model calibrated in Europe and applying it to you know, transferring those model rules to North America, that's not necessarily bad. If we look in environmental <laughs> space and see that the crucial areas in North America are also well represented mm -hmm. in Europe. So model transfer is not necessarily bad if we are thinking in environmental space terms. What is bad is, I'll use the term more specifically and formally, extrapolation, which is transferring a model to conditions that were not represented on the calibration area. So deserts or humid rainforests in Europe. <laughs> And that's where we get into big dangers. And yeah, you need to use some method of evaluating uh, extrapolation risk. MOP and other tools that have been proposed for that are MESS and XDEP. So I think that MOP uh, has conceptual advantages. Um, so distinguishing between model transfer mm -hmm. and extrapolation is really cru crucial. And model transfer is fine because it's the same conditions provided that the species has access to those places. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I think, I, I think if people consistently start saying this distinction between transfer and extrapolation, transfer in geographic space versus extrapolation in environmental space. I think every, everything will be much, much easier to understand. We cannot turn back uh, the clock and fix our, fix our past papers where we, we and many others, you know, mixed these ideas together. Um, but I, that's the, what's really, really important. And I think extrapolation is always risky, um, but I don't think it's always necessarily wrong or bad. And I think, these um, analyses uh, that you guys are talking about, characterizations of how mm, far it, like how far you're going into to different space are important. Um, but the other thing is, you know, if your model is simple enough, you can look at the response curves for individual variables and see if it makes sense. Um, and when you do have the opportunity to see, you know, both, parts of a, a distribution see if you have a response that goes up and then it goes down um, then you know in in your study region then you know if it's going down and you have an environmental truncation it's it's probably pretty safe to continue to say it's going to go on down right yeah, um, and that's illustrated in uh, some cartoons that my students made me make because um, uh, <laughs> all of my good figures are because my students made me make them um, 
So in one of my uh, papers on in the New York Academy of Sciences, um, but also uh, another paper that Jamie was involved in, I'm gonna put this in the chat in just a second here. Um, we were interested in projecting to the past, the last glacial maximum for a species of montane uh, shrew in Mexico. This is one I talked about a little bit in, the, in my talk. And um, you know, so at that point, it was colder than anywhere today, right? Um, but fortunately, in um, the study region, there are some mountains that are so high that they're above the species limit. And there were some places, you know, where there's, you know, glaciers at the top. And under some ways we, uh, we did our modeling, we never got anything where the response curve was going down there. And so they're really small areas, but they were really important for us. And we eventually, following something that Jamie suggested, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, in theory, that makes a difference. But I don't think in practice it makes much difference at all. It's um, something that Jeremy Vanderwall had pointed out to me, you know, in, in theory at least a while ago, um, that you need all of those environments. Um, anyway, when I did, we finally did what Jamie said, we actually did get a reduction. Uh, it started to go back down, and that made an enormous prediction in the projections uh, to the last glacial maximum. Um, so that is the kind of ecological realism. So this is the only thing I'm going to be able to say that speaks to these questions about ecological realism here. When you know a few simple things about what is ridiculous for your species, you know, you can look at your model and say, is this doing something ridiculous or not? And when we're transferring across time or space, um, then I think that's way more important. So in these risky situations where you can say, okay, I've got some environmental extrapolation I would have to do to make a prediction, um, you know, how risky does it look like it is, then inspection of an individual response curves um, can make a, a difference in, like, in how confident you should feel that you're doing something reasonable, right? Um, so, this is um, this is this is important, and um, I think also we're trying to push for like this gets into with max ant clamping or not clamping, which I, mm -hmm. hopefully someone has or will go into. Um, but we're trying to work to develop more flexibility under the scenes in MaxNet at least, um, so you would have the option of clamping or not clamping differently for different variables or different tails of the variables. Um, because there's, there's no reason to expect that one is better uh, across the board. So. Okay, well, um, we're, we're at our hour. Um, general principles that have been mentioned are um, professors and established people, remember that your students are usually smarter than you are. That has certainly been my experience. Um, remember for those who are jumping into the field that just the fact that this paper is by you know Rob Anderson doesn't mean that it reflects Rob Anderson's current thinking because you know well three of us on this call have been at this for 20 years or so uh, two have been at it for less time but we've all learned lessons over that period of time and the stuff that we were doing at the beginning of our careers is not what we would do now. So, you know, try, those of you who are starting out, try your very hardest to figure out what is the current uh, situation in a field rather than um, just depending on what somebody has published at some point in his or her career. Uh, and then last thing on my list is, Marlon, it's really, really disturbing me, but the happy birthday bag above and to the left of your head has always been turned 90 degrees for the last three months. <laughs> and I don't have many OCD tendons, <laughs> but that's really been bothering me this whole time. Somebody moved that back. It was my wife, so I'll talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, and thanks to those of you who are tuning in, and we'll, we'll be back next week with more. Take care. Thanks, Good guys. luck, everybody. Enjoy Bye. the next Bye. section. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Good seeing everyone. Thanks.